Tonight's reading will be from the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 24 through 27. I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Appreciate Caleb and the reading of the word just a few moments ago. We're going to look back at that verse in just a moment, so you might want to keep your Bibles open to Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 27. I don't know how many of you... um, when you get hurt, how you react to that. There's different ways that we do. The other day, it's something as simple as a paper cut. I was uh, flipping through some pages in my office, and I went to turn, and I scraped a paper, the edge of the paper, on my finger. And I still have the little tiny, tiny mark there that caused me to grab my hand and close my mouth and make some funny noises, like mm, something like that. It hurt. A lot, just that little tiny thing. I've had people come up to me with little tiny splinters in their hands, practically in tears from that little splinter. Not a thorn, but a tiny little splinter in their hand. We react different to pain sometimes. I was had my knife out one day and I was cutting a potato and it turned on me and when it did, my knife just went kind of down the edge of my finger. Well, I quickly put my hand around my my left hand, around my right hand, and held it. And then, for whatever reason, and I thought it was kind of funny later, but I didn't think it was quite so funny at the time, I looked at it, but when I looked at it, it was almost like I was pulled back and going like this looking at it, thinking that maybe, just maybe, it's not nearly as bad as what I think what it feels like that it is. So we have a different way we react sometimes to pain. But I want to challenge you to look in uh, 1 Corinthians before we get to the lesson this evening, and it has to do with the lesson. But 1 Corinthians chapter, 2 Corinthians, excuse me, chapter 11, verses 22 and following. Are they Hebrews? So am I, Paul says. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I more so. In far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten time without number, often in danger of death, Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city and dangers in the wilderness. Dangers on the sea and dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure upon me concerning all of the churches. Paul certainly had his struggles, didn't he? He certainly had trials and tribulations that he went through. But there was something unique about Paul that should be in all of us. Paul had that unique ability to put things where they needed to be in their proper place because he realized the prize. He realized the mystery of God. That mystery was revealed to him on the road to Damascus. All of those prophets, all back in the Old Testament times, 
that prophesied those wonderful prophecies about Jesus really didn't understand the things that they were prophesying. Isaiah, when he prophesied the 52nd and the 53rd chapter, didn't really understand who he was talking about when he made those prophecies. All those other prophets, even King David, when he prophesied about the death of Jesus on the cross, didn't really understand who he was talking about when he prophesied that. According to Colossians 1, 24 through 27, all of that was a mystery to those people in that time. They could make the prophecies. The Holy Spirit inspired them to do that. But they knew very little about what those prophecies were referring to. And yet, Paul's about to find out on the road to Damascus exactly what that mystery is that even those great men of old did not understand. He was about to come to the realization. He had lived what he thought was a wonderful life. He thought he had dedicated his life to God from the time he was a young man. He went to Jerusalem to study under one of the greatest teachers known at that time. And he studied about the Hebrew way. He studied about his own tribe of people, those from the tribe of Benjamin, and how they long survived past many of the other tribes and stayed loyal to God, even though the tribe of Judah swallowed them up. The tribe of Benjamin was one of the most loyal tribes that existed. He understood all of that, and it was with some pride that he said, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. He understood about the people, and he understood about his God, and he wanted to put a stamp of approval on what he thought God would want him to do by persecuting the church. And friends, he wreaked havoc, and that's according to God's word. He wreaked havoc on the church in the first century. In his mind, he was convinced he was doing God's work and it was full steam ahead with that. And he persecuted many of our brothers and sisters in Christ back at that time. And he did it thinking the whole time. He was doing exactly what God wanted him to do. And going to Damascus to arrest Christians and bring them back, was when God revealed that great mystery to him. It came in the form of a brilliant light. And it shined bright on him and he fell to the ground, blinded by that light. The voice that talked to him was not that of the Father, but it was of the Son. And the Son, the very one he had been persecuting, Ask him, why do you persecute me? And at that moment, the mystery was revealed to him. He could see clearly now, spiritually speaking, the mistake that he had made. And for the rest of his life, he dedicated himself to the proclamation that Jesus Christ was the Son of God who lived a perfect life who gave himself on the cross for all of mankind and who arose on the third day victorious over even death itself. Paul became a humble, submissive, loyal, obedient servant to the very one he persecuted for all of that time. When Paul writes this epistle to the church at Colossae, He's doing it from a prison in Rome. Paul had spent some time traveling all these different places preaching the gospel and finally the very concept that he had at one time of persecuting the church is going to catch up to him as he begins to be persecuted by the government back at that time, by the Hebrew people and by the Romans. But he had assembled this wonderful team of people which should tell us something today. We're a team here at this church working together. 
the successes we have come about because giving God the glory, we work together as a team. And Paul had this wonderful team of people that he was working with. And you can recall some of their names. John Mark was one of them. Luke was another. Timothy, Titus, Epaphras that we spoke about a little bit in class this morning was yet another one. All these wonderful names of people that we recognize from Scripture. Paul had assembled this team and they traveled about proclaiming the gospel and whenever they set up a church in a town, giving God the glory again, Paul would leave one of these individuals in that town to be the preacher, just like he did, just like what happened in Colossae, even though Paul himself had never been there at the time of this writing. Epaphras had gone, one of his co-workers, had gone to this town and established a church there in the, in the name of Christ and some time had passed and that church was holding firm to the teachings that Epaphras had shared with them about Jesus and Paul's in prison in Rome and Epaphras is going to leave and go to Rome and meet with Paul share with him the wonderful story of this church in Colossae that was standing firm to the glory of God and by the time Epaphras and Paul meet up Uh, Epaphras finds himself also as a prisoner in Rome with the Apostle Paul. I said this morning, uh, it appears, and the reason I say that, it appears that Paul was released. The reason that that's stated is because Paul makes a direct statement in Scripture that he will be released and he will go to some of these cities that have a church in it. And since the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit, he didn't say in that, I think I'm going to be released, but it was a bold statement. When I am released, I'm coming to you to visit with you. Tradition tells us he was released. And tradition tells us that he went to some, many of these cities that are spoken about where he did not have a hand in their beginning and he visited with them. And he went on as far as Spain before he's rearrested and brought back the second time in Roman custody, he's beheaded. At the time of this writing, though, Paul was in chains. He was innocent of any wrongdoing. And yet, this Bible says, your Bible says, he rejoiced in the suffering that he was going through. How could he rejoice in the suffering that he was going through? The answer is, the mystery had been revealed to him. And friends, the mystery has been revealed to us. And yet, that little scratch on my finger caused me much grief and pain. Spiritually speaking, whenever I suffer a little bit for Christ, does it cost me that much pain? Or can I also, because I know the mystery and the fact that it's been revealed, can I also rejoice through that pain that I'm suffering? Paul had not broken any laws. He had not stolen anything. He had not been convicted of crimes. He did not live a reckless life as a criminal would. To the contrary, he healed people. He prayed for people. He taught people. He showed them the power of salvation and what it could do to change their life. And it appears that he was willing to go through much, much suffering for the good of the church. So I'm going to make just a few observations about his suffering and how he was able to do that because that mystery had been revealed to him that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I don't necessarily think what Paul is saying in the opening, and let's read it one more time real quick. In uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 27, Now I rejoice, he says, in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh... I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up that which is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God's, uh, that God bestowed on me for your benefit, that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God, that is, the mystery 
which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been made manifest to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So I don't think what Paul's necessarily saying here in this case is that he's saying, I'm willing to substitute myself so that you won't have to suffer because I don't think it's within Paul's right to do that, spiritually speaking. We've all been challenged through Scripture to know ahead of time that there's going to be a certain amount of trials and tribulations that we go through as Christians. Perhaps some of them revealed to us it's outward and we know what it is and perhaps some things even happening behind the scenes that we're not even aware of. So I don't necessarily think that was what Paul was suggesting here. Paul isn't suggesting that because of his actions of being imprisoned that that would free us or the Colossians up from having to suffer some fate along the way. In fact, churches in this very region that Paul's writing we talked about today, Laodicea and those other churches in that region. Those churches were guaranteed that they were going to suffer. John, in his writing, the book of Revelation, he says regarding these churches, Fear not that which you are about to suffer. And then he talks about the trials and tribulations in Revelation 2.10 that they were going to be suffering. Be thou faithful through death, he says, and you'll receive a crown of life. In heaven. I think more than likely what Paul's doing in this opening is trying his best to convey to these people how they need to behave when hardships come their way. Paul, in that 2 Corinthians 11, verses 22 and following, laid out that list of all the things he had been through. And I think he was trying his best to prepare them to be ready for hardships that were going to come their way. Already, in chapter 2 of the book of Colossians, he's going to warn them about two groups of people that are going to come among them and try their best to disrupt what's going on. That first group, even though he doesn't call them by name, he gives us enough information that more than likely that was Judaizers that were going to come in. And what they were going to try to convey to those people, those good brethren there in Colossae was, you must first become a Jew before you can become a New Testament Christian. The other group probably was the Gnostics. They were going to come in and they were going to have some mystic teachings. They thought they were the ones that were enlightened, the only ones enlightened, the only ones that could properly interpret what they, the church needed to do. They also thought that Jesus was not the Son of God, but an angel-like figure that would come in and out in human form into their lives periodically and teach them things. Completely contrary to what God's words tell us. Now it's true that Paul had successfully prepared himself for suffering. He did that by examining the suffering of Christ through that unveiling of that mystery. So more than likely, he now was preparing the church to do the same thing. And I hope we're also prepared in that regard too. Paul understood, as he withstood all these different persecutions that came his way, that uh, the enemies of the cross had it in for him. They wanted to see him destroyed. They wanted to see the church destroyed. It amazes me that while he was in prison, he writes this epistle to them and over and over and over again he talks about the encouragement that this group of people were to him while he was in prison. He doesn't complain that he's in prison unjustly. He simply makes a statement about it and he moves on to send this great letter of encouragement to this church. It could be said that Paul was not so much suffering in their place, but instead he was suffering for them in their interest. Have you ever suffered for someone else? I'm sure you have. You might not even realize that you had at the time. 
Not so much in the spiritual sense, but in the physical sense, have you ever suffered for someone else? Have you ever stepped in and took the punishment for somebody else along the way? And maybe they were extremely thankful if you did that. Or perhaps they didn't even acknowledge that you did it. But whether they acknowledge it or not, you stood, you stood up for them. You put yourself in front of them to protect them. And you did protect them from harm. At that very point, you did that without much thought, without any hesitation, without complaining, in a very noble way, because you loved that person enough you were willing to do that. In Auschwitz, the famous Nazi um, Jewish uh, detainment center, there was a man by the name of Maximilian Kolbe. He was a very religious man. There was a plan to escape. Three individuals were going to leave that camp to escape. I don't know if the three individuals made it or not. I don't even know that part of the story. All I know is that the Nazis brought everybody out. They towed all the camp, how disappointed they were that nobody let them know about this escape. And they said, because of that, we're going to put ten prisoners to death. And the way that they were going to do that was through starvation. Simply put them in cells, ten people, and let them die. And so they called the names of those ten individuals. One of them was a man with a wife and some kids. Immediately he begged for his life. And they said, there's nobody willing to take your place. Who would do that? And then from that crowd, there was a voice. It said, I'll take his place. It was Maximilian Kobe, this religious individual, who was an aged person. And he stepped to the front, and they accepted it. They took Maximilian and put him in along with the other nine. Fourteen days later, without any food and water, he was the only one still living. And he was making such a mockery out of that death sentence that they ended up having to give him a lethal injection in order to take his life. Do you understand, 2,000 years ago, that same phrase was said, it was said at the cross. It was said for us, I'll take their place. Jesus Christ stepped up. He moved us out of the way, and he bore the iniquities of our sins on that day. Well, not only did Paul understand that he needed to set the proper example for all churches to follow, not only did he want to uh, assure them that you can face these trials and tribulations and make it through them. But he also wanted to tell them you can actually rejoice when you're suffering. And it's at this very moment that he does that through his writings. At the very moment Paul was being persecuted, he was writing from that prison and he said those words. You can rejoice even when you're being punished. It's not as if Paul was saying Way down the road, 20 years later, you can do this. But he was actually living it in real time whenever he wrote these words. And it's not as if Paul was saying, you know, uh, I could do this. I could withstand. He was actually withstanding at this very time. And the only way that he could do that was because this full mystery of God had been revealed to him. Paul understood the mystery. Do you remember the very moment when you came to know that mystery also revealed? When you heard the word of God and you said, I believe these words. Do you remember that very moment when Christ was revealed to you? You probably do because it probably changed your life forever for the good. Now I've had a good life. Uh, born into a family, not everyone can 
claim born into a family of believers. Now, when I say born into, I was actually about three when my mom and dad became Christians. But for the vast majority of my life, raised by godly parents, <clears throat> most of my teachers, even in public school, considered themselves God-fearing individuals, and they were good teachers. Having been now for almost 40 years in some way affiliated with working with the education ministry of the church, I feel like I was put here on this earth to do this very thing. Along the way, I've seen a lot of great things happen. God's blessed me. I've seen a lot of people accept Jesus Christ in the watery grave of baptism. And it's been a definite blessing for, for that to happen. But I'd be lying to you, and the same could be said of you. Not everything always went smoothly, as maybe I would hope or others might hope. There have been difficult times. There have been some hardships. There have been struggles and there have been disappointments along the way. But even through those times, through all of those trials and tribulations, I certainly can rejoice at where God has placed me in my life and in my work. I can see God's hands involved in my ministry. I can listen even when I have failed along the way, I can listen to the words of God and, great, and gain great comfort from that. And even though I haven't suffered nearly like someone like the Apostle Paul has, my suffering's been limited, not nearly as severe. I certainly can rejoice that God has put me here at this place, at this time, to help fulfill a small, small portion of a ministry on this earth. And all of that's happened because at some point that great mystery to those people of old was revealed to me through the written word that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Are you sharing that revelation today? That thing that has been uncovered? Are you sharing that with mankind? Are you letting his marvelous light not only into your light, but shining so that your family and your friends and your neighbors can see that? Are you setting the proper example for others along the way? Are you even rejoicing in your suffering, setting a proper example in that? And maybe you're saying, I wish it was that way. I wish I could say that. Or maybe you're saying at one time it was that way. Today it's not so much that way. So the challenge is going to be left up to you tonight on your spiritual journey to get back where God would have you if you're saying those things. You know what motivated you to become a Christian. It was the realization that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and you wanted to dedicate your life to him. So could you not tonight get that back to where it needs to be, where it was at one time? You certainly can if you want to. And it could be that there's some, perhaps in the audience this evening, who are struggling because they've never fully accepted Jesus Christ. They haven't entered the watery grave of baptism. You certainly have an opportunity tonight to do that as well. So please, without hesitation, in a bold way, without being ashamed at all, take that step and come to the front if you need to be uh, given that opportunity as we stand and sing.